Thank you for being here today. I am thrilled to have the opportunity to preach this morning. It's not something that I take lightly, um, but I'm thrilled and really, truly ecstatic to bring the word of God today. I believe we'll be helped and challenged by the truths of his word. In 2003, Aaron Ralston had an unbelievable experience. You may have heard this story. It was all over the news a couple decades ago. And while he was hiking in Utah, a boulder fell and pinned his right arm. After multiple attempts to escape and break free, finally, on the fifth day of being stuck there, he amputated his right forearm with a dual multi-tool. He then rappelled down a 60-foot cliff and hiked five more miles before finding a Dutch family who guided him to a rescue helicopter. They took him to the hospital, and he eventually survived this event. Truly a remarkable story. But what does this story show us? It shows us that we as humans will do remarkable things to live. Right? We will pay for the best doctors. And we'll do absurd uh, diets and try these wild exercise routines. And at times, cut off limbs to live or to prolong life. And I want to pose this question to you this morning. If life truly is that important, then what do you live for? What is your mentality regarding life and death? Maybe a better question, what should your mentality be regarding life and death as a Christian? We are continuing our study today in the book of Philippians. And we are going to examine the life of the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul shares in Philippians what his mentality is to life and death. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 19. Philippians 1, 19. As you're flipping there, I want to remind you of some of the context that has been set for us the last couple of weeks. And we know who's writing this letter. It's the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Philippi. But we have to remember that he's not writing this letter from a a comfy mansion overlooking the beach or or on a golf course, right? Paul is writing this from prison. He's writing this under house arrest. He he was chained to another guard at all points of the day, 24-7, chained to another guard simply because he was preaching Jesus, an unwanted situation, an unfortunate situation, something that we would not desire And it's during this time that Paul writes his perspective on life and death. If you're there in Philippians chapter 1, let's read uh, the, the verses and then we'll jump into the message today. Verse 19, the Bible says this, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by your coming again. Paul outlines his perspective on life, death, and suffering. And in a section of the Bible that contains one of the more famous verses, Paul conveys this thought that to live is Christ and dying is gain. See, Paul had answered the question that I posed to you earlier. What will you live for? And he had filled that in with Christ. He said living is for Christ. And we are going to examine that aspect of his life today and how we as Christians should live for Christ. But then he says this, dying is gain. 
And we've heard this verse many times, but, but that's a mind-blowing thought. That Paul would say, dying is good. It's a blessing. It's a positive. Right? In a world that, that seeks to prolong life and will do all these things to prolong life and the quality of it, how in the world could Paul write that dying is a good thing? We're going to study that today and the mentality of the Apostle Paul and how it can become our mentality as well. Today the title of my message is this, The Unstoppable Mentality. The Unstoppable Mentality. We will discuss how we as Christians can have a life worth living and a death worth dying. I notice firstly in these verses the Christian's goal. The Christian's goal. Paul says it in verse 20. So now Christ shall be magnified. The Christian's goal is to honor Christ. That's the Christian's goal. That was the goal of the Apostle Paul and the goal of each one in, in here that should be our goal. And most of us would agree that that's a noble goal, that we should pursue that. Yes, I want to honor Christ. Yes, I want Christ to be magnified in my life. Yes, I want to make much of him and make much and do much for the kingdom. Yes, that's my goal. I want to bring honor to Christ. But how do we do that? How did Paul magnify Christ? I noticed this. He relied on him. He relied on him. Who was Paul relying on in this unfortunate circumstance? He was relying on Christ. He, he was confident that him taking human measures was not what he needed. He, he was confident that what, it wasn't in his hands. He was confident in Christ. Look at verse 19, if you would. Paul says this, for I know. For I know. Paul possessed a level of certainty in the midst of an unwanted hour. And in the midst of an unfortunate circumstance, how could Paul be so certain? Why was he so certain? And the reason he was so certain was because there was a confidence in his Savior. He says, I know that this shall turn to my salvation. He was convinced that his present suffering would turn out for his deliverance. It appears that Paul may be quoting from Job in the Old Testament. We know the story of Job. Went through a, an unbelievable, unbelievably miserable day. Maybe the worst day a human's experienced other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And, and what did Job believe? He, he understood correctly that, that this suffering, this trial, is not God's punishment for my sin. This is not God getting back at me for something I have done. And like Job, Paul fully believed and was confident that God would be his sustenance through this trial. He was confident in his Savior. The word salvation has sparked some debate here. What, what is Paul really referring to when he says, the Lord, or, um, this shall turn to my salvation? What's he referring to? Well, well, some say he might be referring to salvation in the literal sense. Okay? So, so God is going to deliver me, rescue me from my current situation. Right? Later in the passage, he says, I know that I will be with you again. So, so maybe Paul is referring to the literal, literal sense, that God is going to uh, break me out of jail. He's, he's going to deliver me from what I'm walking through. Others believe he's referring to salvation in the eternal sense. Right? Because in a, in, a, in a verse later, he says, whether it be by life or by death. Either way, whether he's talking about salvation in a literal sense or salvation in the eternal sense, Paul understood this, his trials were temporary. His situation was temporary. He was confident in his Savior. And I know, especially in this auditorium, there are some in here who you are walking through unfortunate situations, unwanted trials. Maybe it feels undeserved trials. And you've come in this morning carrying a weight, some visible and expressed. Others carrying this weight that feels like you have to bear it on your own. Some in here got that news from the doctor recently that you weren't expecting or anticipating. You weren't hoping for. You, won't, you weren't wishing for. You didn't want to hear that phone call. 
others come in with the, the stresses of life. And you've got more money going out this week than you've got coming in. And you're, and you're right now, you're just, you're just, you're, you're, your mind is turning of how am I going to make ends meet this week? Someone here carrying that. Others, you bear the weight of maybe a, a child who's not with the Lord, not close to the Lord, who's walked away, living their own life, doing their own thing. And, 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 and you, you struggle and you bear that and you carry that burden and, you've, and you brought it in with you to church tonight and, and there's been sleepless nights. And then there's been tears shed. And there's been begging, God, please show up in their life. God, do a miracle in their life. And you've got these struggles. What's the answer? The answer is not to play dumb. The answer is not to be naive. It does, it's not more faith to act like your situation doesn't exist. That's not more faith. Did Paul do that? No, he didn't. I could take you to a passage where Paul says, I've gone through this, and I've experienced this, and I've walked through that. He didn't play dumb and act like his trials weren't happening, but Paul was more confident in who his Savior was than what his struggles were. And we can be too. God, I don't know why you're choosing to allow me to walk through this. God, I don't understand what you're doing right now. Can, can I be honest, God? That verse that all things work together for good to those that love you, it's getting pretty hard to claim right now. I'm really struggling with that one right now because I just don't see how this can turn out for good. But I trust you. These struggles are real. These situations are real. But I am more confident in you, my Savior. Paul could rely on Christ because there was a confidence in his Savior. But what else was going to sustain him through this trial? There was a confidence in his Savior, but there was a confidence in the saints' prayers. Verse 19, he says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. Through what? Through the prayer. Sorry, miss, I, I, look, I thought I knew it. I didn't. Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at the relation between those two in just a moment. But I want to linger here on prayer for a moment. Because prayer mattered to Paul. And to believe that your prayers don't matter. It's so foolish. God uses means. And one of the means that he uses to supply strength to his servants is that of prayer. Well, what does James tell us? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It does much. It does great things. Your prayers matter. Your prayers do work. And so when Paul says this, I'm going to be sustained through your prayers, it's not just some random passing thought. It's not just something he felt like he had to throw in there to sound more spiritual. No, prayer mattered to Paul. Read his letters. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. What does he always say? I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Paul believed that prayer was the means God uses to supply strength to his servants. And can I say this? Liberty family, prayer cannot just be a passing thought in our church. It needs to be what sustains our church. Let us be a church that prays for one another. As, as a community of believers, that we lift each other up in prayer. That we are on our knees throughout the week, begging God to show up in the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's going to be a, a mind-blowing thought. But I can't pray with you about something I don't know about. You're walking through something, and not in a way to, to try and get attention or to seek glory for yourself, but because you, you're weak, you're struggling, share it with someone. Hey, I, I, I'm weak right now. I, I need some prayer. I need some strength. I need God to show up in my life. Would you pray for me? Those of you who have been saved. For a while now, you've been coming to church for a while. Can I encourage you? Find someone. Ask them, what can I pray with you about? That, that new couple that, that slides in. Hey, pull them aside. Hey, is there something I can pray with you about? That, that teenager that it seems like they, they used to be so on fire for God. They used to be so close to God. And it seems like they're drifting now. And, and, and they're not showing up as much as they used to. When you see them, hey, is there something I can pray with you about? And if they are so bold to share with you what they need help with and what they are lacking in. 
then we must boldly approach the throne of grace and beg God and cry out to God on behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us be a church that prays for one another because prayer does work. So what was going to sustain him in this trial? He, he was, there was a confidence in his Savior. He was confident in the saints' prayers. But I notice also in verse 19, there was a confidence in the Spirit's provision. Verse 19, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That word supply describes a full, a plenteous, a sufficient amount of what is needed. And we often run to all sorts of human measures to try and take care of our problems. And Paul is saying, the Spirit provides more than enough for you. The Spirit is our sufficient resource in times of need. Regarding praying, the Bible tells us that the Spirit intercedes for us when we are weak and don't know how to pray as we should. Have you ever been there? I've been there a few times. I'm, I'm crying. I'm broken. I don't know what to say. I can't even mutter a word. And you know what the Bible says? That the Spirit is interceding on my behalf. What a thought. What a truth that God's Spirit is going to supply more than enough. But don't mix it. These two go together. Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So it's not, okay, the Spirit provides more than enough. So I can check out. Oh, good. He gives more than enough. No, no, no. The supply of the Spirit does not negate the need for the prayer of the saints. But as we pray, as we cry out to God, the Spirit will provide more than enough to supply the strength that we as believers need. So Paul says, this is my goal, and this ought to be every Christian's goal, is to bring honor to Christ. And the way that I'm doing that through my trial right now is I'm going to rely on Christ. But not just rely on Christ, he says, I'm seeking to represent Christ. Paul says, I'm going to bring honor and glory to Christ by relying on him and by representing him. Verse 20, if, you would, if you'd look with me. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, that with all boldness, so all, all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Paul says that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, he was confident that he was going to represent Christ well. He said, Christ is going to be magnified in my body. How do we represent Christ well? How did Paul represent Christ well? I, I noticed two things that helped Paul in his effort to represent Christ well. Paul could represent Christ because there was a confidence in the promise of God. He says this, this is my earnest expectation and my hope. Well, what Paul was grasping to and latching onto wasn't positive thinking or wishful thinking. No, but rather the Lord's promise. He says it's my hope. And what is this hope? What is this expectation that in the eyes of God, Paul would never truly be put to shame before Caesar, the world, or the church. That Christ would be made great in his life. That was the hope he was clinging to. That was what he was latched onto. Now the word hope, we have to understand how the, the word hope is used in the Bible compared to our vernacular. Right, because I'm going to use the word hope a little bit differently today than Paul was using it. Right? I'm getting excited for the NFL season, big Niners fan. We know we've got a few in here, right? <laughs> but, but this word hope, right, I might say something like this. I hope... The Niners win the Super Bowl. Well, what, is, what does that mean? Well, it means maybe they will, maybe they won't, right? I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a possibility, maybe a good chance, but I'm not entirely sure. Is that the kind of hope Paul's referring to? No, Paul's not uncertain here. Paul is confidently expecting Jesus uh, to be made great, to make Christ great. And this confidence doesn't come through delusion. He's not just saying, well, power of positive thinking. Situation looks really bleak right now, but God can do it. Power of positive thinking. 
That's not what he's saying. I love what Clay Scroggin said. I think we have the quote. It says this, when these powerful truths become the foundation for how you see, you can do the inconceivable. You can choose positivity. But this is not just a positive thinking, a self-delusion that ignores reality. It's based on a different perspective of your reality, a panoptic view of your circumstances. This is what I love. The end of the quote, trust-fueled, hope-filled, forward-thinking people can push through anything that gets in their way. Why? Because their eyes are fixed on more than what's directly in front of them. Paul was not talking about the power of positive thinking. Paul is talking about the power of his promising Savior. That's what he's clinging to. That's what he is latched onto, that I'm going to represent Jesus. And he says, in nothing I shall be ashamed, so that with all boldness, as always. Always. That includes the good times and the bad. He says, I'm representing at all moments of my life. In the mountaintops and the extreme valleys, Christ will be exalted always. I love the month of March for one reason in particular, because it's the time that March Madness is on. If you don't know what March Madness is, it's a college basketball tournament that takes place and the best teams compete. And oftentimes the teams will get sponsored by, by different brands. And Nike usually sends out the warm-ups for some of, of the higher schools and the, the upper colleges. And oftentimes it'll be a phrase or, or something catchy, something short on the warm-ups of a school. And I remember uh, in 2016, the phrase that they chose to use for the schools that were sponsored by Nike was this phrase, always reppin'. Always reppin', followed by the school's logo. And what were they trying to communicate to the players? That as a player for our school, let me, let me explain what reppin' is for those who are confused. <laughs> there you go. Reppin', short word for representing. Okay, so short word for representing. So it's saying always representing. All right, it's a little more, uh, it's, it's short, a little more slang. Some of you are like, I'm not going to get this illustration. I don't know what repping means. Okay, always representing. All right, that's what, that's what the, the phrase is. And they're saying you are always repping, followed by the school logo. And what's, what's the, what are they trying to communicate? That as a player for this university, as a player for this school, you don't get to pick and choose the moments you represent us. You are always repping. You don't get to uh, choose that when we hit that crazy buzzer beater and we go into the next round. Yeah, now I'm part of that school. That's me. I go there. I play on that team. I'm repping. And then when you're on the other side of things, you suffer heartbreaking loss. You don't get to abandon us then. You don't get to say, no, I'm not with them anymore. No, as a player for our school, you are always repping. And if I could summarize maybe Paul's life. What Paul is saying here in, in 21st century language, he is saying this, I am always repping. I'm not picking and choosing the moments I represent Christ. In every moment, I am representing him. I hate to burst anyone's bubble in here, but if you think you get to pick and choose the moments you represent Christ, you are so far off. If you are a saved believer in here, you are always repping. You are representing when you're at your workplace, and you are representing when you're at home with your wife and kids, and you are representing with your unsafe friends, and you are representing when you go on th th that vacation, and you are representing at every point of the day, all day, every day, always repping. You don't get to show up on Sunday and throw your hands in the air and say, praise Jesus, and then tomorrow act like you don't have to represent them. It can't happen. As believers, we are always repping. You're always repping the king. When life is going good and things are going well and stuff is looking up, yeah, things are good. Thank you, God. Now, now, now I'm, on, I'm on Team Jesus. Stuff's great for me. And then the moments of misery come and sadness and grief and unwanted situations. It's not your time to abandon. You can't. You are always repping the king. So he had a confidence in the promise of God that Christ is going to be made great. But he could also represent Christ because there was a confidence in the plan of God. 
the end of verse 20 says this. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. When? Whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul was not certain what God's plan was for him. Either I'm going to continue to serve Christ through life and exalt him through my life, or I'm going to glorify Christ through the final exaltation of my death. Either way, Paul knew that God had a plan and his will would be accomplished. He was sure that God's will would be accomplished. I love verse 21. It's a, it's a famous verse and one that many of us have committed to, to memory. But in the actual Greek, there's no verb. And so if we were to put it kind of in today's vernacular, it doesn't make as much sense. sense. But no verb, it would just simply read this. To live Christ, to die gain. I like that. It's simple. It's short. It helps me latch on to what Paul is trying to get across. To live Christ, to die gain. Paul understood that, hey, living is for Christ. And while God gives me opportunity and ability, I'm going to serve him while I live. But he also knew that dying was gain. Because he says, I'm going to be united with my Savior. I, I, I'm going to have this vile body transformed like unto his glorious body. And I get to be with my king. The apostle's very existence was wrapped up in Christ. He, he traveled for Christ. And he preached for Christ. And he was beaten and imprisoned for Christ. And eventually he would die for Christ. But that's because he said, Christ, you're all I'm seeking to magnify. So I trust your plan for my life. This is the Christian's goal. It's the goal of Paul and it's the goal of each one in here. That we would honor Christ. And how did Paul do it? By relying on Christ and by representing Christ. And, and may that be said about each one of us in here. No, mo no matter what we're walking through. There's a believer that's relying on Christ. And no matter where we're at throughout our week, there's a believer that is representing Jesus Christ. That is how we bring honor to Christ. Now the second and final point. I see this, the Christian's dilemma. So not just the Christian's goal to honor Christ, the Christian's dilemma, life or death. In verse 23, this is what... Philippians says, verse 23, look down. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. I'm in a strait betwixt two. All he's saying, I'm in a difficult place. Uh, there's a dilemma, right? If God lets me stay on this earth, then I know that's going to lead to fruitful, joyous serv service for my king. And that wasn't just Paul's private aim. That had made its way to every aspect of his life. God, if you leave me here on earth, I promise you I'm going to bear fruit for your kingdom. Can that be said about us? Are we bearing fruit? Not in a work salvation, not in a way to uh, try and gain favor with God. But simply as a believer who is a branch connected to the vine and bearing fruit for the kingdom. Is that said about our lives while we're living here? Are we bearing fruit? It's a convicting question to, to think about. So, so the one aspect is I get to serve Christ through life. But then the other aspect is I get to be united with Christ. United with Christ in death. And this is why I've titled the sermon The Unstoppable Mentality. And we'll kind of get to where we're going now at the end of the sermon. But it was a win-win for Paul. It wasn't either or. It wasn't one's a positive and one's a negative. Both were viewed as positives. God, whatever you choose to give me, I'm going to be ecstatic about. I'm going to be thrilled about. I'm going to be stoked for. Whatever you choose to give me, life or death, I'm ready for it. It's a, it's a gift from you. I was trying to think of something that would illustrate this for us. What, what are two options that maybe uh, we would consider a win-win. And I, I really am not that creative, so I, I couldn't think of, of much. But I thought of a YouTuber. All right? I don't 
don't worry, I don't, I don't support this YouTuber recently, okay? Um, but I used to watch him back in the day, and maybe you've heard of him. His name's Mr. Beast, all right? His name's Mr. Beast. I really don't watch his stuff anymore. But I used to love Mr. Beast. And if you've never seen Mr. Beast, Beast videos, he does all sorts of crazy things. But one thing he does is he gives absurd items and absurd amounts of money to random people. And so you can imagine I'm walking down here on Bison Avenue, and all of a sudden I see a film crew with Mr. Beast standing there. And he calls me over, we got a random stranger. Come on over, Titus, come on. You want to be in a video? Sure. And as I, as I walk up for this video, I notice on this side, a top of the line 2024 custom Lamborghini. And on the other side, a top of the line 2024 custom Ferrari. And he says, the video today, Titus is going to spin this wheel. Whatever it lands on, I'm going to give to him. Now, if I, if I could pick, I guess, I'm going to pick probably the Lamborghini. Don't hate me for that if you're a Ferrari guy. But I'm probably going to pick the Lamborghini. But suppose I spin it and it lands on the Ferrari. And he says, I'm going to give him the Ferrari. What's my response going to be? Are you kidding me? That's not what I, I didn't want that. Is, that. is that my response? Not at all. I'm going to be thrilled. Are you kidding me? That's what you're going to give to me? You're going to allow me to have that? It doesn't matter which one you give me. I'm thrilled about it. And that's the mentality of the Apostle Paul. God, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you give me, life or death or suffering, it's a gift from you. I'm thrilled about it. I'm ecstatic about it. I saw this uh, uh, interaction. It's a, it's a bit humorous, but I think uh, it, it might convey the mentality of the Apostle Paul. And it's the interaction that maybe he would have had with some of the prison guards he was chained to. And, and, and they're chained, they're locked up to the Apostle Paul. And they get together and they say, hey, Paul, we don't like your Messiah, and we don't like the message you're preaching, and we don't like the things you're saying about this Jesus. So guess what, buddy? We are going to kill you. You can imagine Paul. That'd be great. <laughs> Dying is gain. Bring it on. I, I, I could imagine the, the guards are a little stunned. What? He, he just said dying is a good thing, so they reconvene. Okay, Apostle Paul. On second note, we're going to let you live. Paul sits back. Fantastic. <laughs> Living means more joyous, fruitful labor for my king. Second time, the guards are taken back. What is this guy on? What's he talking about? He wants to die. He wants to live. And they reconvene a third time. And they come and say, okay, we're going to let you live, but we're going to make you suffer for what you've said. And Paul guys, I consider the sufferings of this present world not worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed unto me. It would fill me with joy to suffer for the name. Do you see the power in this perspective? Kill me. I'll, I'll, I'll be with Christ. Let me live. I'll live for Christ. Make me suffer. I'll experience joy and get rewarded by Christ. This was the unstoppable mentality of the Apostle Paul. And it can be ours as well. See, see, the Apostle Paul wasn't cut from different cloth than you and I. It wasn't that he had some superhero ability to trust God more than you and I can. The reason Paul could have this unstoppable mentality is because he treasured Christ above all else. Notice all three of them. What do they have in common? Kill me, I'm with Christ. Let me live, I'm for Christ. Make me suffer, I'm rewarded by Christ. All three of these were positives because Christ was what Paul treasured above all else. See, Paul had answered this, who he was living for, who he was treasuring, and he was treasuring Christ. But often, we don't treasure Christ above all else. Let's be real. Often, living is not Christ. And we fill that blank. You can imagine, living is blank. Just, just picture that with me. Living is blank. And we fill this blank with all sorts of cheap substitutes. Well, well, well living is money. And living is making sure my, my kids go to the league. And living is, is getting that next car and that, that new house. And living is chasing the thrills that this world has to offer me. And living is gratifying that desire. Living is about having as much fun as I can. And if that is what we define as living then dying is what happens when that gets stripped away. If living 
is money, then dying is being broke. If living is accumulating stuff, then dying is when we leave it all behind. If living is fun, then dying is when the fun ends. If living is chasing that high, then dying is when the high is no longer. When we live for things of this earth, dying is what happens when they get stripped away from us. The story is told of John D. Rockefeller, the world's first billionaire. Extremely generous man, but still very wealthy at the time of his passing. And someone was curious just how much money he left behind. And so a few days after the passing, he got with the accountant and he asked the accountant, how much money did Mr. Rockefeller leave behind? The accountant paused. He looked down, thought about what he was going to say, and looked back up. He said this, he left everything. He left everything. There was nothing he could take with him. And while that applies to money, that applies to anything that we treasure above Christ. You can't take it with you. And so if that's what you live for down here, then when you die, that's what happens when that gets stripped away. We leave it all. We leave it all. So what will you live for? What would you die, what will you die for? This week, what will you live for? To, to be fair, I'm not trying to be rude. God doesn't care what you think or what you verbally say. He cares what your life is marked by. See, Paul's life was marked by fruit. What will you live for this week? I'll challenge you to live with this unstoppable mentality. The only thing left standing in a billion years is not some business that you built. It's not going to be some car that you drove. It's not going to be some house that you lived in. It's not going to be the thrills that this world had to offer. The only thing left standing will be Christ. Live for him this week. Treasure him above all else. God, if you're leaving me here for, uh, on this earth and you're giving me opportunity, I'm going to use it for your glory. I'm going to bear fruit for your name. And God, if you want to take my life, that means I get to be united with you. I get to spend eternity with you. And God, you're allowing me to suffer right now in an unwanted situation. And I may not understand what you're doing. And sure, maybe that verse is, is hard for me to claim that all things work together for good right now. But I'm going to rejoice because it's going to bring me joy to suffer for your name. Because I treasure you above all else. Of good news, church, each one of us are still living. Do you know what that means? We've got ability, and we have opportunity to live for Christ this week. I know there are many in here. You say, decades ago I committed to live for Christ. Decades ago I made that decision. I would challenge you. It's so easy to get distracted and to fill in that blank with other things. Uh, this week, what will you live for? Live for Christ. Live for his kingdom. Live for his name. Teenagers, young adults. You say, I made that decision at a camp a few years ago, that I'm going to live for Christ. How are you doing? How was last week? Was there anything that reflected a life lived for Christ? Purpose, today, I'm recommitting to Christ. I'm getting back on track. This week is not for myself and selfish ambition and, and, and building my name. It's all about him and building his name. I'm living for Christ. Let's treasure Christ this week. It's only when Christ is our treasure that we can have a life worth living and a death worth dying. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. I pray that you would have used them in someone's life today. Help each of us to live for you. We can't do it in our own strength, but we know that your spirit supplies more than enough strength for us. We love you in Jesus' name. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation. Not just because it's what the church always does, but because we want to give you an opportunity to humbly bow before God, to submit to him with the posture of kneeling. There's nothing special about what happens down here at the front, but it's acknowledging, God, I need you. I'm weak. I'm frail. I need strength this week. I want to live for you, but I need your help this week. And in a moment, I'm going to encourage the church family to come forward and pray. Even if you're not comfortable, I'm going to encourage you 
to do that, to commit that this week I'm living for Christ. And maybe we've got misaligned in who we're seeking to represent. Come forward and talk to God about it. God, I'm seeking to represent you this week. I know there are many walking through struggles. And even if you're not walking through one, I'm sure you know of a brother or sister who is going through one. Let us be a church that prays for one another. I'm going to encourage you, come, come forward and, and beg God and cry out to God on behalf of your brothers and sisters. Ask God to show up in their life because we understand that prayer is the means that God uses to supply strength to his servants. So I'm going to ask you to, to come and bring those requests before God and ask God to supply strength to his children. The piano begins to play. If you'd like to come forward, come, come forward and kneel and talk to God.